Hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy, and today I have a longtime friend and probably somebody you've heard of more than once and probably well worth the listen. So tune in for my time here with Wynn Schwartow. And of course, as always, please follow us on LinkedIn and, and make sure you subscribe so you can always get the latest updates. Wynn, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I mean, I, this is kind of cool. I had I had uh, I, I lost a day yesterday from my fourth COVID shot, and so I'm back, and it's like suddenly being full of energy. So I've done energetic things today, which was kind of surprising after feeling like absolute <laughs> crap yesterday. Well, everything's relative, you know. You feel great, and you lousy one day, the next day, anything's better. You know, it is what it is. You go through it. I just wanted to keep my ass uh, better protected than not protected because we, you know, we're all starting to get out again a little bit. Yeah. And of course we're all getting a little bit older too. So. Well, maybe you are, I have chosen the opposite. You've chosen the opposite. Yeah. I, I still track my age in hexadecimal. I'm still in my thirties. So it's uh yeah, but you can do hex in your head. I can't, I can't. <laughs> well, that's because of things like Packer Jeopardy, which might be a fun thing to start talking about. I mean, you're the guy who started it all way back at DEF CON 2. Oh, that's uh, when the idea came up. That's, ah, okay. It was at DEF CON 2, uh, Jeff and I were talking, and I assume we were all probably drinking a little bit at that point because there was a very tiny bar at the back of this room that held, what, 150 people? And everybody was, in retrospect, looked 13 years old. Jeff looked maybe 15 years old. No, no, no disrespect, Jeff, at all. It's just, I mean, that was 30 years ago. And uh, we were talking, and I said, he said, what do you think? I said, I love a lot of the content. I think some, I said, you need more controversy, and you need some games. He goes, what do you mean games? And my mouth preceded anything that my brain had intended. And I said, you know, Hacker Jeopardy. He goes, so do it next year. And that's what happened. And a legend was born. And, uh, you know, I, I came on that show, I guess it was first time DEF CON 5. And it was with Ira Winkler and with Dead Addict. And I remember thinking, like, guys, we, we was a runaway. We had more than twice as many points as the next team. There's no way we can lose. And your scorekeeper was drunk and he screwed it all up. And I was like, no, who that's was, not who right. Who was the scorekeeper? Do you remember? I, I don't. I don't know. But the desert is big and it's uh, very forgetful out there in Vegas. So we never heard from <laughs> <laughs> from him again, but that's where I kind of you know came on board and kind of been your Ed McMahon for what twenty years. Yeah, yeah, or something it, like it was. That. It was, I guess, in those days. Uh, hey, anybody here, at DefCon? Can you add? Mm -hmm. And that ended up apparently. I don't remember it being an epic fail, but I certainly don't begrudge it at all. Well, it was fun, and we had a lot of chance to do that. So we we did it like what was it twenty. 19, I guess, was the last year before everything locked down and COVID. Uh, you know, Hacker Jeopardy came back, got back to the black badge status at, at DEF CON. That was a big deal. You know, kind of, uh, and then, you know, went around a lot of other different events. And so that was your contribution. Of course, there's one over in Germany, and now there's Hacker Jeopardies all over the place. But uh, you are the man. Well, I'll thank you. I'm honored. But it was, I mean, it really wasn't brilliant. It was mouth before brain. And that's kind of what you're famous for, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to take that as a little left and a little right in terms of the, <laughs> well, if you think about it, you've been a prolific author, you know, you've written all kinds of stuff. I mean, even things like the idea of a digital Pearl Harbor, I remember we did it. Pearl Harbor, electronic yeah. Pearl electronic Harbor. Electronic Pearl Harbor. Okay. Uh, I'll we'll, we'll stand corrected. But how much difficulty did you have way back in the day in trying to even get a publisher to pick up on that idea? And how long ago was that? Oh, boy. I, I, you know, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that question. The or, original version of the book was probably 150 pages, I'm guessing. And that was 1989. And uh, I had been working a lot with Q's uh, aircraft and uh, some interesting stuff we were doing. and. I had the whole epiphany on information warfare, what have you. And then so I wrote this thing, and I sent it to my lawyer. And I said, you know, there's some stuff in here that even scares me. 
well, what do you think I should do with this? And he goes, if you publish this, they're going to kill you. And I said, Alan, come on, come on. He goes, no, dude, this is like really too crazy. You can't do this. Go write a novel. And so Shara, my wife and I, we talked and I said, all right, I'll go write a novel. So I wrote a novel called Terminal Compromise that then became uh, PearlHarbor.com and Die Hard 4. So I wrote it, and I'm a, not a great novelist, not at all, but it was still a pretty good story. And a couple years into that, uh, Congress asked me to testify uh, about cybersecurity. It was the uh, review of the 1987 Cybersecurity Act, Computer Security Act, Security, sorry, yeah. done by Glickman and Valentine, if I remember correctly. And... I somehow got called to go speak on this, and then the electronic Pearl Harbor and the privacy gone and all of those statements made, it was June of 91, if I remember, suddenly this whole motion thing kept going. People said, why don't you write about it? So I took the old book, worked on it for a while, and to your question, um, turned down by publishers. I'm going to guess a hundred. And then and again, to Thundermouth Press. Thundermouth Press was, <laughs> boy, uh, the, they were, they, they somehow came out of the 50s and 60s and emerged as a publisher in the 90s with that ancient vibe. It was a hippy-dippy place. And they sort of, the guy behind it, Neil Rotenberg, not Rotenberg, Neil Cronenberg, I forget his last name. He got it. He absolutely, totally got it. And because it was a small independent press that he owned, um, yeah, okay. And he gave me some money, finished it, and I guess it was 14 months later it came out. So th there was a lot of time in there, and that gave me a lot of practice on the road at that point. Yeah, and it kind of got you going into the, the book writing thing. I know you put out a bunch of them. I mean, one that I liked from a number of years ago was Time-Based Security. And... I'm, gl I'm glad you bypassed a lot of the others because <laughs> <laughs> they were okay. They were okay. Well, I mean, the Information Warfare 2 was really great because there were so many contributors to it from mm -hmm. around the world. And there was some of my work in it, but largely it was such a, a cool compendium of when back in the day people were allowed to think and come up with ideas that were new and novel and challenging and controversial. And we don't see that anymore. And if you can tell I'm ranting on that, yeah, I'm ranting on it because we need that kind of thinking again that we had for a period of about 10 years. And then it went all money, corporate, beltway, and, and end of rant. Uh, but in that time period, uh, one of the problems that I had, and I guess a lot of has had, is can you measure security? What is security? Some, you know, some of the fundamentals, and I'm re-approaching that again now from a quantum mechanics standpoint, actually. But back then, it was, well, let's come up with something. And I'm going to give full credit to a, a gentleman named Bob Ayers. And we had a, got hired by the new Polish Operaceks to teach them about American security. And this was 95, I believe. Bob was with the DOD. I was just with me. And so we fly over to Poland. And we have a five o'clock meeting with Derchek and my God, they, they, Pacek. Pacek was his name. And five o'clock, you know, 5.15. So what do you do? What's the first thing you do at 5.15 if you're at a bar and somebody didn't show up? Just get yourself a drink, right? Yeah, you get a pivo. A pivo. And that's one of the first words I knew <laughs> in Polish. Pivo. So Bob and I can have a beer, and then we have another beer, and it's now after six, and we don't have the cell phones, we don't have any of this stuff, and we kind of rely on people showing up for when they're supposed to. If anybody remembers that, show up when you promised. So time went on, beers went on, munchies at the bar went on, the napkins came out, and Bob put forth this idea based upon research he had done through DISA by uh, early, early superficial pen testing of the entire DOD. 
and he wanted to know how fast does it take people to notice that they've been screwed with. And this was an incredibly novel concept back in 94 and 95. And so we messed around, and I loved it. I fell in love with the concept. And that is where the original formula, uh, detection time plus reaction time, must be less than the amount of time that it takes for protection. And that was on the napkin. And that's what began it all. And so I asked Bob permission, can I write this? He goes, go with it, go with it. Just And then that formula in the series of very simple concepts back then, yeah, I'm very proud of that. I really am. And then that obviously turned into analog network security yeah. with my dear friend, Dr. Mark Carney, PhD in mathematics, who formalized it all. So a lot yeah, of good people- old, Good old in, math, Mark. Yeah. A, a, a lot of people were involved in this. It just wasn't me. I had an idea, but I needed, there were a lot of people involved over the years. And you've been really good at mobilizing people and kind of intriguing them and getting them to say, hey, this is something that's really interesting and you want to be part of it. Now, I know with a time-based security, for those who never had a chance to read the book, and you talk a little bit about formula, but to put it kind of in a vernacular, if you're going to install a burglar alarm at a bank, and the cops are up the road, and the alarm goes off, if the time it takes for the alarm to detect the burglars and the time the cops to show up, if they can show up before the bad guys can get away with the money, you win. And if the bad guys get away before the cops show up, you lose. And it's a pretty simple concept, but then you're able to extend that to a lot of things over in the cyber world. And I remember just kind of for fun, because we known each other reasonably well at that point, I said, hey, you didn't ask me for an endorsement on the back of your book. I was going to say, never has so simple a concept been covered with so many pages. That's some- <laughs> all <laughs> right. Sp- Spaff said that later on something <laughs> else I did. <laughs> but the point was, you got the idea how, and you've always kind of kind of the leading edge on a lot of these ideas. I mean, how about InfoWarCon? Uh, what was the genesis for that? Again, I'm going to give credit to somebody else. This, I'm, I think, was just when my book was coming out, that Information Warfare. And I was invited to keynote at, and I, I want to get the name right, the first international conference on information warfare, I think was the name of it, put on by Dr. Mish Kabe. Mm-hmm. And if people Remember don't know him. who Misha is, look him up. Brilliant, brilliant guy. We have been friends forever, and I tortured him that I was going to tell Jeffrey Dahmer jokes in my opening remarks at a conference. And he's never forgiven me for doing that. <laughs> and of course, anybody under the age of 50 has to go Google Jeffrey Dahmer to figure out who it was. And but again, this was back 30 years ago yeah. when I did that. But Misha held this, uh, the conference, and it was at a hotel in Montreal in February, if I, if I remember. And, I, and Bob Bales was there and some other uh, folks back from the day. And I said, hey, Bob, you know, I'm going to ask me, let, let's go do this in Washington. It really should be there. Let's, and we talked and he said, what do you want to call it? I said, InfoWarCon. And I was riffing off of DEF CON. Again, it was mouth moving before brain. And Mish gave his blessing. He helped and got involved with some of the early orchestration of it. And InfoWarCon uh, began the next year. We had budgeted and set up at the Hilton there for 125 people. And instead of 125 people, 375 people showed up. And the biggest negative review that we got that year was the box lunches sucked because we had to make a, a very quick shift. Yeah, I remember getting a chance to speak at a couple of those. And uh, mm-hmm. I remember it was interesting because this was early enough when, you know, for me still as in the military as a reservist, my frustration was is that I kind of seemed to be a few years ahead of my peers in terms of having the cyber stuff. And I'm like, wait, who's going to mind the store when this thing goes high order? I remember a, a brigadier coming in and pretty much just reading his script for his slides and not even understanding perhaps what they even meant. But the point was that DOD was at least out there at the time. Today, we've got some amazing talent uh, that exists throughout all the ranks in the military. But it was events like that that got people thinking, hey, we need to be out there. We need to be thinking about that. And then we need to go ahead and get some of our leadership on board with this. 
there were uh, two four stars that were very, very early in their thinking and absolutely got it. Uh, the, the first one was uh, General John Sheehan. Right. And he was, if I'm correct, the whole SAC, Atlant, NATO, something. He was in charge of all that. And the comment that he made that the media picked up was, paraphrasing roughly, we don't want a bunch of long-haired 14-year-olds kicking our ass. Roughly. Mm -hmm. The other gentleman who was absolutely brilliant was uh, Air Force General John McCarthy. And he, uh, first time I met him, I think he came to the one in Belgium because he was uh, somehow tied in with NATO as well. And he pioneered a lot of the cyber training out at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Absolutely, absolutely got it. And then obviously there were so many other people behind it. Uh, and Hayden was there as a one star in the very early days. Mm -hmm. So we, we had some great, great people that I believe had some influence. My problem is it took too mm, long. I, I would agree. I know General Cartwright, I think, also had a clue. He was the uh, vice chairman of uh, the Joint Chiefs. I think when I finished up my, my career and I'm thinking like, OK, this is great. You know, the, somehow the gatekeepers let some people who were either cyber aware or they were very fast on the uptake and making really good decisions. And now, of course, as we see today, cyber is its own war fighting domain. And well, that we had suggested that I, I, I would have to go back to some of the early writings. But that was an entire discussion that I opened up uh, that the military was certainly not happy with at that point because they were. Uh, all sort of in a land grab for cyber. Yeah, Air Force kind of got their hand slapped when they went ahead and ran ads saying, like, we're defending a nation with the 24th Air Force. I don't remember where they were at that point in time. And they got ahead of themselves because Congress hadn't yet allocated them that mission. But I remember back, this is around, probably around the year 2000, I was going to the Naval War College and had to put together a thesis. And so I said, my thesis is the U.S. military shall establish a new uniform service for fighting computer warfare. We didn't call it cyber back then without regard to height, weight, physical fitness, drug use, or you know, anything else. It's in tattoos. It's like, are you, you know, are you loyal and can you hack? And my professor said, that is such the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. I'm not even going to approve your thesis. So kind of like Fred Smith getting a C on his paper for Federal Express, uh, but he went ahead and built it. I went ahead and I wrote a totally useless paper on manpower policy, got an A on it. But I think you have been there too. And I have this on the back of my business card and you know that, and it's kind of my life and maybe yours too, in three lines. If you're one step ahead, you're a leader. If you're two steps ahead, you're a visionary. And if you're three steps ahead, you're a heretic. And when you're a heretic, you can't come back five or 10 years later and say, I told you so, because they had their fingers in their ears going la, 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 when you're trying to warn them about this stuff. I went through this in the audio industry real quick. When CDs came out, I was in the, and I'm going back now. This is the mid seventies. CDs came out. Um, I was absolutely, totally against them for two reasons. One, they sounded like shit. Number two, mathematically, I could prove why they sounded like shit. Yet the vendors of the day, largely Sony and those guys. Nah, your hearing is only this. It only works like this. It works like this. No, it doesn't. And of course, I lost, which was one of the reasons I actually, not the reason, but one of the reasons I left the audio industry was because technically I was disgusted. And I guess throughout my cyber career, you know, I built some stuff for the DOD, did all that, you know, way back early. But then getting into theory, I, I don't, if I'm a her heretic, I, I don't think using something that's already been invented and overlooked and trying to repurpose it is heresy. It may, maybe it's visionary if you want to do that. Uh, but it's just the one thing I'm really good at and I've always been good at since I was a kid is systems. I can see systems in my head. When, you, when somebody's giving a, a lecture 
and you're at a talk and, and they're going on and on. I close my eyes because I don't care what their visual is. I care what the visual that I develop is. And there's a component of eidetic in there that really allows me to visualize systems easily. It's not a skill I can brag about. It's just something I have. And I think that has helped me put wild ass stuff together in combinations that other people don't think of. That's all. Yeah. And it's almost like music. I think you know, there's some people who just are amazing musicians and they get it. And then there are people who have absolutely no talent. And in between are the people who can push the keys in the right order. And they don't really get music, but you can put them in front of a piano and it's, they can do even beyond chopsticks. But well, I look uh, at it from, from my drawing ability. I am stick figure challenged. Well, XKCD would uh, you know, probably have been your, oh, your venue. Yeah, but I look at that as high art compared to what <laughs> yeah, I, I do. Re- I'm sure Randall will take that as a great compliment. I mean, he's, he's got a wonderful sense of humor. How people can do that the p- painting and art of any sort, it astonishes me. How people can be musically attuned astonishes me. So uh, I guess when people look at our field, all of us that you know have some degree of technical understanding, many of them are astonished uh, as well that we understand and can talk this language that they don't speak. It's just a different skill set and uh, an acclimation over decades, I think. And I think a lot of people look at, for example, a, an author. I mean, everybody says, you know, G. Mark, when are you going to get your book out? And yet you've got, what, 14? I'm trying to remember. I I've lost, I, I've I, lost I, count. I, I mean, but some of them we don't talk about. But we, right, so we'll, we'll just you know, we don't talk about Bruno. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those things we don't cover. But kind of what I always thought of as your magnum opus was analog security. Yes, that's and, I agree with that. And that was that was my last going to be my last book. And and that book, in my opinion, is really a work of art. It's not just the work. I mean, there's a, amazing. How did you put together that team and 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 get that together? I mean, that there's got to be a good story in that one. Uh, Oh boy. When time based security semi sort of became a little bit of a thing, and I'm going back to this was 99, was really what happened. I was uh, in Perth, Australia, and we were at a university. It was at a PhD program I was helping with. And we got really talking about time based security. And I had this incredible frustration that it was so incomplete. It wasn't there enough. Yes, there were bits that were cool. But ugh, just driving me nuts. So I sat for two days at the hotel in the pool, working in math and math and trying to, and looking for that, gestalt, looking for this answer. And so over the next several years, I was looking for what am I missing? What am I missing? And slowly pieces would just kind of appear, and, but it w- still wasn't complete, wasn't complete until I think it was 2015, 2016. I was giving what I considered to be, okay, I think I have the pieces together. Let me test it out in, 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 in an audience format. Because I hate lecturing to audiences about what I know. I really like lecturing about shit I don't know, because then I can learn from them. And so that's very selfish, but it's a lot of fun. And I gave the talk, and this guy gets up, British, thick British accent, and he goes, Win, you're full of shit. And I go, thank you. God, first beer is on me. And we uh, sat down, and a few of our other friends from around, we sat down on, on the floor at, uh, at the bar, some beers, and the napkins came out. And Mark says, you know, you're really wrong. You're wrong about this. No, no, okay, no, that's right. All right, now you're wrong about this because the math does, oh, shit, no, that's right. And this isn't me bragging here. It's he was taking some concepts that I had with very, very simple, simple uh, high school level math, turning them into whatever advanced mathematicians do with advanced math, analyzing it that way and saying that the fundamental concepts were right. And that was what was important to me. So then we spent the next three years, uh, 3,000 pieces of artwork, uh, two incredible ladies, Kaylee Melton and Alyssa Phillips who uh, allowed me to torture them for two years uh, in putting it together. And then Mark being the overseer of the mathematical accuracies, 
and then reviewers uh, like Spath and a whole bunch of others that I uh, who's uh, I really really respect and they're all credited in there for a re so yeah that was going to be my last book that's true and, and uh, it's I nice to finish on that high note I mean I remember you were sending me emails with equations like Jimmer is this true is this right and I'm, I'm going yeah. to them it's like why are you asking math stuff it's because you got a degree in math you don't know this stuff and it's yeah. like yeah, it actually is right. Or I remember tweaking a couple, but yeah. I think you were just trying to vet out this other Mark to say, no, this. no, I wasn't trying to vet him out, vet him out. It was more, I was, that was all before I met him. Oh, okay. And what happened it was we were in Paris and it just exploded that weekend and hundreds of napkins. And then he, he, I was able to talk him into writing a, a full treatise on it. Now, I'm thinking if there are any city in the world that I would have a random chance of running into you, it would be Paris. And <laughs> I mean, you, know, you go there you, to write books, to think, to work stuff out. What, and, you know, hack in the dark, other stuff. Uh, you know, what's, the, what's the security, the hacker culture, et cetera? I like that over there in uh, Paris. Well, in the last two years, I... Haven't really seen many right. people over there. None of us have. Yeah, yeah. I got a sister who lives over, over there. I haven't seen her. Yeah, I've been over a couple times. Uh, but no, the, the hacker scene is um, not happening until it looks like it's opening up this June uh, with Hack in Paris, uh, which uh, they've had me, I, I have the honor of hosting it uh, for them. And this will be the 11th Hack in Paris, 10th one live. You know, we're all making these adjustments. And what really got me uh, intrigued with them very early on, because I was the year one keynote for some un unknown reason, was the depth of technical seriousness for all of the topics involved. And I'm comparing this to U.S. Um, hacker cons, which often became just pure drunk fests. And I'm not accusing, not saying anything wrong. Is there's just there was a lot more party atmosphere in some of the U.S. hacker cons. And so this I'm talking now 2010, I guess, 2011. Things had toned down a lot, but there was still a lot of that. And over there is, yeah, everybody's, the beer is getting pounded, but they're all geeking hard time through it all. And the conversations, uh, I could engage some really, really smart people very, very quickly and get them to challenge me a lot easier than uh, perhaps over here, which, which struck me as almost the antithesis. That was like, like you're on American if you don't challenge me. Well, I got to go to get, you know, it's it, the, almost the opposite. But it, yeah, it's, it is cultural. I mean, I taught for, for 10 years with SANS and mm -hmm. I had, had, you know, American audiences, European, uh, Asian, et cetera. Yeah. But I got the toughest questions over in Europe where there, these folks would be willing to kind of like, you know, challenge, and they wouldn't just accept it as doctrinal. Why is this true? Not is it true, but why is it true? So you you've had the same experience I I, had. I have. So it, it's and I find it refreshing. I don't I don't want to just have a bunch of people just sitting there going like, okay, fine, okay, oh, fine, yeah, whatever you say. And, and at the end, walk up and say, I got a copy of your slides. Uh, as you had said, you want someone to stand up in the back and say you're wrong. Yeah, and it's like yes. prove it. Yeah, let's now it's time. All right, we'll get, we're going to go offline. And do it absolutely, and I, I. So in a post-COVID world, I am going to be doing less live. I'm not going to pop around city to city and city anymore. Done, mm -hmm. done with that. If I'm in Paris for three weeks, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll zoom in anywhere. I'll, you know, I will help and participate, but I'm just not popping city to city anymore. Yeah, that that, that you know, you and I both live crazy schedules in some years, you know, well over a hundred flights in a year. And you know, I'm starting to, starting to roll back out again. But, you know, as we look at it, what do we see kind of as a, you know, what are you seeing from a bigger theme? Are we going to be losing that sense of everybody's got to physically be there? Because for years they've been talking about, Hey, all you need is a high Wi-Fi Wi-Fi connection and some water supply. And you can live on a mountain in the middle of nowhere and be effective. And we're kind of getting to that point. With uh, with satellites up there being able to give us our uplink downlink at decent speeds, thank you, Elon. And you know, are we moving away from a society where everybody had to be in a group to one where we can just very happily interact? Oh boy, you you how much time do we have? <laughs> Got about another fifteen minutes. <laughs> well, 
I, I'm just going to touch on this. What you have just described is actually some, oddly enough, some stuff I'm looking at to piss some people off, which I'm not going to go into detail on. But what you just described is something that's fascinating. In the last two years, we have, and we'll just say our fields, because we all know each other and we've known each other physically, personally, drinking, and, you know, partying and geeking. Uh, for the last two years, we have interacted using only two of our human senses. Well, that's true. Last time we got I'm together, just, I, I, did, I didn't taste you. Um. <laughs> Think about it for a second. Yeah. We've only been using two of our human senses now for two years. We know that a lot of people, even those of us that are on, some people have had some emotional dips and ups and downs. I miss people. I miss mm -hmm. people. Which means that they are missing three of the other sensory suites. Look at it from that angle and forget everything else. Look at it from the human angle and not the technological angle. And there's a lot that's going to come out of this with some work that I'm doing. So do I and I want to be with humans 168 hours a week? Fuck no. No. Nah. None of us do. We all, the reason small conferences worked is because we got to spend a couple, three days periodically getting together, catching up, and not living together with our five senses all the time. But we can retreat back to our two, two sense interactions. When you look at the world from that perspective, you're going to see another analog spectrum. And what is that analog spectrum going to be? It's going to be those ups and downs and emotional kicks that say, hey, I got to get out. Eight months into COVID, I was going nuts. Finally hit me. First eight months, I was all good, right? At least I think I was. And I went nuts. Got to do something. So we sort of had a pod of eight people, ten people that we were all being, doing nothing except with each other. And I booked a private restaurant just so we could go do that and get out for a while. And we had this wonderful evening out, uh, completely isolated, completely safe, completely indulgent. Yes, absolutely. But I haven't traveled for eight months, so I had a bevy of money saved up. So I think if we start looking, and I've made this argument in, in analog network security that over the last 50 years, we're designing technology and expecting the human to adapt to it. And a lot of the viewpoints I'm getting and taking now are much more of looking at it from the human and what do we need to do to do other things. And this gets into the metaverse. This gets into some really bizarre areas that uh, require months of discussion. And I know that you know, when dealing with humans, that had been an area you'd focus a lot with the security awareness company. I know we'd worked together on some stuff on that yeah. one. And I think even maybe CEO for a while. And it's like, yeah, you know, I remember when I told Kim, I said, yeah, when was going to give me a BMW, but I told him, no, he said, you go get that car. And <laughs> 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 but you're able to team up with two showermen at no before. Yeah. And that's really was a force multiplier for your way of being able to see things and then share that information, not just to inform people, but to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, you got to work with Kevin Mitnick there as well at, at No Before, and they got another some great peaks. But so, how did how did that evolve, and how has that worked for you? How do you how do you like doing that? The uh, the arrangement was stupendous. It it really was, and I'm gonna uh, I'll shout it out from day one. Over the years, we have both seen companies get bought, and you know, No Before bought the security awareness company. And over the years, you've seen them get bought. And whatever the reason that the company buys another, there's some intrinsic value need that is supposed to be there that will increase the benefit of the new entity. But what also happens is there's a molecular <laughs> integration like Bernoulli's law that everything gets merged together. And the whole value of that uniqueness of the reason you were bought gets dissipated. So the deal was 
Stu, you're buying us for a reason. Keep the team together. Integrate LinkedIn. Do what is from the corporate standpoint, obviously, but let that team do what they're so good at. And they are uh, just absolutely killing it, as you guys, as you know, the industry knows how well Noble Four is doing. So I am doing stuff entirely non related to any of that. I am playing with technologies that um, really can't talk about because it's all under, you know, private stuff and not doing day to day security awareness per se. It's all pretty much geeking out on technologies and how they work with humans and things like that. Now, you, you kind of mentioned in passing, but I want to come back to it, is it's probably going to become a big thing soon. Quantum. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at quantum computing and they'd be able to do stuff, ultimately maybe going ahead and we'll, we'll break Bitcoin, we'll break all these asymmetric algorithms because what would take billions of years can now be done with qubits in a fraction of a second, if we can ever get these things to stabilize and actually run. Well, but what are you seeing from a security perspective uh, with quantum or even beyond security, beyond just the fact that when we can get enough qubits, we can go ahead and run like Shor's algorithm and break factoring things and, and stuff like that? I am certainly not a quantum expert and I don't want to pretend to be uh Get Dr. Mark Carney. <laughs> Seriously, some of the work, I don't know how much he can talk about publicly, uh, but some of the stuff you will love, absolutely guaranteed, G. Mark. Will quantum crack Shor's algorithm? Yeah. Will that be a vertical application? Yeah. Because at this point, the generalized quantum computing efforts are they an engineering problem or is there something much more fundamental going on we don't know that answer is i i am skeptical that we'll have under current technological approaches a scalable general purpose quantum computer that you can run your own home version of basic on mm -hmm. i just don't see it with the current approaches when it comes to futures of computing and solving problems there are some that are going to have to be optimized for it. Yep, and I see that happening. I'm going to have, how do I build a nanomolecular little quantum machine figure this bit out? Yeah, I can see that. But what I'm really interested in following a little bit more is some of the efforts that are being done between the research institutes in Japan. And I wish I could remember the names of them, but my Japanese, i just not that good. And Purdue University is probabilistic computing. Now, here is the fundamental way that I interpret it. They're going to maybe argue, but that's fine. I'm not an academic. Probabilistic computing the, is basically averaging. You can do probabilistics in so many different ways, but it's an averaging function over time. Now, what is the total power output con consumption of all the data centers in the world today? Isn't it something like 4% or 5% of the planet. I mean, it's an obscene amount of power. And we're doing the digital realm the way that it was designed. Shockly, you know? I'm not knocking, it just is. When you do probabilistic computing, your power consumption goes down 90 to 95%. At the basis of probabilistic computing is because it's not digital. It's like a slide rule, fundamentally. How close is close enough? really becomes the, the question. So when you've got massive amounts of computing needed, how close do you need 10, you need six sigma? Do you need nine sigma? What do you need? And probabilistic computing uh, technologies are going to allow the scaling and tuning of it to the accuracy that is required that will adjust time, power, resource consumption, of course. But I'm much more interested in that than I'm more than quantum, and probably because I, <laughs> I understand that. And number two, nobody understands quantum. And <laughs> I don't want to. Yeah, I, I, think, wanna... <laughs> I think it was Feynman who said, "If you say you understand quantum, you don't." And I know enough to know I'm absolutely confused. 
that was a course that I just couldn't get my head around as an undergraduate. Everything else I got, but quantum physics, it was like, how could it be yes and no at the same time, true and false? It's, it's here and there, and it moves fast than speed of light. And, and you're right. And I even got David Bohm's book on quantum. I figured, right, great. I got a math degree. I can read this stuff. And very quickly, I realized mathematics is like any other language. If you don't lose it, you use it, you lose it. And I was like, Man, it's going to take me five years to come back up to speed if I ever want to get my head around it. And by then, the whole world has moved on. But that's interesting on the probabilistic computing. So any other future predictions you might have, but you know, put on your heretic hat a little bit saying, I don't care what people think. But sometimes mm-hmm. you get you nail it 10 or 15 years before everybody else sees it because mm-hmm. you've got this amazing way of looking at the world. What do you see coming? Uh, that's Remember I said Analog Network Security was going to be my last book. Right. I lied. Okay. I'm in about a quarter of the way through a new one. All right. So we know that there's something wonderful coming from the mind of wind. No, it's and... not. I didn't say wonderful. I didn't say that. All right. Something. I just said something. And now for something completely different. <laughs> As I am going through it, it is one hell of an education. Mm-hmm one hell of an education and i'm learning more answers as i go along and i'm having a ball well i think that's really what it comes down to is can you enjoy what you're doing have uh, an ability to educate and maybe influence other people and sometimes just kind of call the turn for everybody else before we get there in the future because you say hey wait a minute didn't we read about this or didn't somebody think about this idea beforehand and then almost like an incident response where it's the drills that you do, it's the practice that you do. Not that you expect the attacker to do exactly as you planned, but you thought through all these different contingencies, and you don't get caught flat-footed. There's two pieces of security that pissed me off in the, what we've really messed up in the last 50 years. And, oh, well, I lose again. Number one, we have concentrated the vast majority of our security efforts at availability and confidentiality and integrity has been a bastard stepchild whether and and in all of the potential ways you can use integrity mechanisms boy it's hitting it's a little here a little there but there, there's no enveloping uh, meta view of how to use it uh, there were some attempts, uh, Gene, uh, Gene uh, Spafford out of Purdue, uh, and then Kim, I forget his name, he was, he, he began Trust, wait, Trust, trust Wire. Wave. Trust Wire, trust Gene Kim? Gene oh. Kim, yeah. yeah. And then I said, oh, this is going to be great, this is going to be, I love it, and because it didn't capture the imagination of the enterprise consumer, they veered off in another direction. I'm still very disappointed that we don't use more integrity modeling. Other thing I'm disappointed in, but I'm glad to see it finally happening now, is for so many years, after Fred Cohen's great work on the Deception Toolkit from, what, 35 years ago, that Deception should have been a very fundamental piece of our architecture 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, and it is. In fact, I did an episode uh, a few months ago with a buddy of mine who has put together a whole course on Deception. And cyber deception, he's saying this is going to be big. And of course it is. And the whole idea is, is that you want to create kind of like a digital hall of mirrors for the bad guys. So when they come in there, they don't know what's good or what's not, but all they got to do is touch one of these booby trapped, so to speak, uh, systems where they think it's good. They get nothing of value. And it goes all the way back to uh, the cuckoo's egg, if you remember Cliff um, Stoll. Of course. Hello. The yo-yo. The yo Have you ever been to one of his talks with a yo-yo? <laughs> He is wonderful. I love his TED talk. He's out there and he whips out the slide rule and he's measuring stuff and, and just dancing around the stage. I, I have one of his creations, a Klein bottle. Oh. And yeah, I remember uh, you know, you know, my wife, Kim, she's like, what can I get the guy who doesn't seem to want anything? And if I need, want something, I buy it. I said, how about a Klein bottle from Cliff Stoll? And she got one. And it comes in a box, you know, Cliff writes all over the box, a magic marker warning, non-orientable surface inside, or maybe it's not inside. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a lot of fun. And uh, he, he, he has been a fascinating fellow over the years. 
But we're, we're kind of at our, our, our time limit here. Any last kind of closing thoughts you'd like to have? Or? No, I listen, you're quite, the thing I appreciate is, number one, you get it. You always have. That's one of the reasons we've always been such good friends. And we've probably, we've never really worked together that much. But, jam, we've talked about a lot of stuff over the years. And you have been inspirational to, yeah, ah, when you're full of shit. Now maybe that's right. And, you know, it's one of those relationships that's required and I'm, I'm thankful to have that with you and so many people in the field otherwise i could get into real trouble and uh, your ability to get to the questions and understand the perspective and the context uh today people don't understand the context of this field of where it came from and some of the thoughts and one of the things that i am uh, waiting to hear from rsa if they're going to allow me to do it, it it's a birds of the feather talk and I'm going to start uh, working on something called the foundations of security. Uh, the same thing that quantum mechanics is attempting to do. What are the foundations of quantum mechanics? Which means instead of just shut up and calculate, what does it mean? The same thing that you went through. I see the ma- or you saw the math. I'm not good at them. You saw the math. Yeah, there's the answer. But WTF it mean? And that was hidden until oh, about 15 years ago, and people are starting to examine it again very seriously. And in our field, we've never done it. What is security? What are the foundations of security? And I am going to begin an effort to work on that as well. And on that note, otherwise, I'm going to keep talking for hours. Well, I think we'll probably wrap it up then, but this has been fascinating, Win. So thanks, as always. Great to get together with you, whether it was in person like a couple of weeks ago or even kind of in our virtual studios here. But, uh, yeah, wonderful thoughts and ideas. Uh, again, winschwartow.com is probably a great place. They can find some of your, your wonderful thinking. We'll put a link in our show notes. And, and if you enjoyed today's show, just do us a favor and, and rate our podcast on Apple Podcasts or, or share it on LinkedIn. We'd love to help more folks with their CISO trade craft. So thanks again for listening, and we look forward to providing you with more great episodes. Until the next time, stay safe.